Welcome to the Capital News. I am your host, Alex Caritas. Today is October 24th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining me. The title of today's podcast is Impeachment Trial by Jury. Now, there's not any new documents that have really been released that are uh, indicative and that describe in detail the facts of this impeachment inquiry. Most of this is being done behind closed doors. I don't personally have a problem with that. That's what the the gist of today's podcast is going to be centered around, sort of digging through all of the noise that exists within the mainstream media, whether you're watching Fox, whether you're watching and listening to CNN or MSNBC or various other websites. These corporations, they have an agenda. They are there to make profit. They know what you want to hear, and you have a station, you have an outlet to go to to hear what you want to hear. We don't know all of the facts of the case. This is deliberate. This is an investigation. Okay? This is not a trial, at least not yet. So we're going to get to that. But I just wanted to take the time in this podcast because I know there has been a lot that continues to be discussed around this impeachment inquiry. There have been some political stunts performed by Republicans recently to sort of interrupt private closed-door depositions. And, you know, this, this, this political circus that exists, and that is Washington, D.C., it's 24-7. We don't have the, the complete facts of the case, nor at this juncture would anybody expect to. This is an ongoing inquiry. So that's going to be, again, the gist and the bulk of today's podcast. But there's some other news that I want to get cover. Obviously, the market updates. We have continuing uh, PMI numbers that have come out for uh, part of Europe. For the United States, obviously we talked about Japanese numbers last night, which were not good at all, but nevertheless, the Japanese stock market was making a 12-month high, sort of indicative of what took place in Germany, deterioration, further deterioration within the German economy, yet nevertheless, the DAX, the German economy, continues to rally and is also, I believe, at a 12- or 13-month high, if not a little bit higher than that. So, you know, it makes one scratch their head. What is going on here? Is the same thing going to take place in the United States? Are we going to continue to receive further deterioration in our economic numbers, but the stock market just couldn't give a damn, and it will continue making all-time highs? We will have to wait and see. We're going to get to that. I want to talk about Donald Trump attacking the Federal Reserve again on Twitter, and of course, yours truly felt compelled to tweet him back today, and this is... This is par for the course. The Federal Reserve has their meeting next week, so Donnie Boy Thunderthumbs has to get out there and taunt them and ridicule them and critique them. I'm all for ridicule and critiquing the Federal Reserve, but when Donald Trump calls for, you know, negative interest rates and quantitative easing, I, I can't stand for that, and we're going to talk about that again. Uh, a, a very brief update to Brexit. Vice President Mike Pence gave a speech this afternoon on China. So we're going to talk about that briefly. U.S.-China phase one, whatever this means, uh, what we're hearing from some sources that are that are being reported on multiple outlets, news outlets, Bloomberg, CNBC, and others, as to what a phase one deal might look like. Uh, it's laughable. And then obviously the impeachment inquiry. So let's start, kick this off with some of the market news. We'll get that out of the way. We have S&P gaining six points for the day. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gave back 28. The Nasdaq rallied 66 points. The Russell 2000, the small cap index, gave back three points. The Dow Jones Transport, despite being on a significant rally over the past few sessions, gave back one half of 1%. And the New York Stock Exchange did close up in the green, but it was relatively flat. Oil continued rising higher ever so slightly. We have WTI at $55.80 a barrel. Brent, the international metric, is at $61.80. In 50 cents a barrel. Precious metals caught a little bit of a bid today. We have gold at 1,506, so it's broken through that $500 an ounce threshold once again. And silver is now trading at $17.83. U.S. 10 year Treasury is now yielding 1.77%, relatively unchanged from yesterday's podcast. And the VIX, the volatility index, was down and is now trading at $13.71. To recap, the companies that we talked about yesterday, we talked about Ford, Tesla, Caterpillar, Microsoft, Boeing. We have Ford giving back 6.6%. Microsoft gained 2% for the day, obviously contributing to the gain in the NASDAQ. Tesla, again, beating market expectations and showed a surprise profit. That stock gained 18 
percent today alone also driving up the gains in the nasdaq boeing reported yesterday as we discussed it gained an additional one percent for the day caterpillar gave back its gains that they were up that they received yesterday they were they lost one percent for the day and then the two companies that i just want to talk about here briefly uh, amazon reported after the bell and they are trading down nearly seven percent so i'm sure that will have a negative effect on the stock market tomorrow if that continues in tomorrow's cash trading session amazon it missed on the bottom line had strong top line revenue growth but it gave weak forward guidance you hear that weak forward guidance you got to be kidding me we're only two months away from the fat man coming down the chimney no 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 you cannot give weak guidance mr jeff bezos this is the strongest economy ever on the back of the strongest most resilient u.s consumer ever you cannot be projecting weak guidance or are you just simply mm, lowering the bar so it makes it easier to jump over so is he lying or is it the truth we don't know we're gonna we're, we'll have to we'll have to wait until next year when uh the fourth quarter earnings are uh, are released but you know to even give weak guidance when we're entering the holiday shopping season that's not going to bode too well especially if it if it is true and we have every reason to believe that it will be because we know that most americans unfortunately or a significant portion of us are living paycheck to paycheck and using credit cards to make ends meet yet somehow this is viewed as a strong and resilient u.s consumer it's not it is not so this is at least fitting with one with what one would expect with all of the economic figures that we're coming across that the u.s consumer is getting tapped out and so one would expect weaker guidance especially coming from the likes of amazon but time will tell maybe there'll be some sort of surprise rally we're gonna have to wait and see but we're only a month and a half away two months away so we're gonna know here in the near future we also have intel another tech company uh, they beat across the board top line bottom line and they gave uh, stronger forward guidance so after hours trading intel is up four percent so if that continues that might have a counter acting effect on the nasdaq and the overall markets tomorrow but we'll have to wait and see what takes place to thunder thumbs attacking the federal reserve once again oh boy so the federal reserve like i said at the top of the podcast will be meeting next week to make a determination as to what they're going to do with interest rates and in all likelihood they will continue to cut interest rates surprise surprise i mean why wouldn't they they've upped their repo overnight their overnight repo market from 75 billion to 120 billion okay they've increased the term repo market from 30 billion to 45 billion we talked about that yesterday Th this is indefinite there is no timeline on this now this is indefinite remember it was a one-off now it's indefinite so for all intents and purposes the federal reserve is going to cut interest rates plus wall street is anticipating that they're going to do so and we know how the federal reserve hates to you know disturb and disappoint their masters in the at, at, at wall street so all likelihood they're going to be cutting interest rates the question is to what degree are they going to cut them by 25 basis points or 50 basis points but nevertheless this still is not enough for donny boy thunder thumbs just ain't happy with it now the argument and we predicted this is what was going to be the case because what else would the president do if he's going to continue on this trajectory on this strategy to continue to you know berate the the federal reserve and what did we say we said well look donny boy's been talking about this for months he's been going after the federal reserve for months saying you got to cut interest rates you got to go back to quantitative easing you got to do all this stuff l even go to negative interest rates if you have to go ahead and do it and he mentioned that again in his tweet this morning well mr president i don't know if you're aware but the federal reserve has been cutting interest rates the federal reserve has restarted quantitative easing although we're not supposed to call it quantitative easing so now what's your beef well as we predicted he's going to say it wasn't enough and it took him too long and that's exactly what he's been saying now that's exactly what was in his tweet and this is now going to be his argument well well yeah they're doing what i want but it, it took him too long i mean th this guy is a, a grown-up child a spoiled rotten little brat is all this is coming down to and again if you follow this podcast i don't like the federal reserve i want them abolished i want them gone okay but when you're the president of the united states and you're going to make these claims that would do 
pretty much irreparable harm to this country, which has already been taken place because of quantitative easing and negative interest rates and zero bound interest rates, and you're calling for more of it? I mean, there's no excuse for that. I can't justify that, even if you are uh, criticizing the Federal Reserve. You're criticizing them, but the solution that you're calling for is, is the problem. It's more of the disease. You're pumping more of the disease, more of the cancer into the system. Exactly what we should not, not be doing. Because his justification, this being the president, is saying, well, look at Germany. They have negative interest rates. And you know what that means, folks? That means that Germany is being paid by all of the people who buy their bonds. Okay? Typically, if you buy a bond, you're the one getting the coupon payment. And then at the end of that bond, once it matures, you get your principal back. Well, now it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Instead of receiving a coupon, you give the German government money every month or every quarter. Does it make any sense? This would, negative interest rates would never happen in a free market capitalistic system. So it's, it's gone. It's out the window. It's out the window. That will destroy our financial system. I'm no fan of our financial system, as you understand, and you know this if you've been following this podcast for a long time, but there are more orderly ways in order to unravel and break down our financial system in this country, as opposed to bringing negative interest rates over to this country, which is going to screw everybody over. Because you're not going to make any money. If you have a checking account, you have a savings account, every month you earn interest. It might not be that much, and of course it probably, it probably isn't, but at least you're getting something. You have negative interest rates, they're just going to take that interest out of your account. Is that what you want? Does Donald Trump mention this to you in his tweets? Does he tell you what negative interest rates really mean? No, of course not. Because he either doesn't care or he doesn't know and either is unacceptable. So that's my little rant there. Uh, but he's going to continue to attack them because they do meet next week and he'll just, he'll continue to increase it. He'll continue to pepper them with, with criticism and calling for more uh, quantitative easing, negative interest rates, and, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, brief update to Brexit. Uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is calling for a general election to be held on December the 12th. We said the earliest that one could take place if Parliament and the Prime Minister were to act in a very, very expedited manner would be, I believe, November 28th. But of course, that wasn't going to happen. So he is now calling for an election to take place on December 12th. Recall that the Prime Minister cannot force a general election. It needs to be approved by Parliament. We have Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the opposition, the Labour Party in Parliament, saying, well, you know, we can agree to a general election if, a big if, if Boris Johnson, if the government agrees to taking a no-deal Brexit off the table. That means that there has to be a deal. So, you know, it's, I guess it's sort of a political savvy move by uh, Jeremy Corbyn of the Labor Party, but is that ever going to be agreed to? Because if that's agreed to, uh, this is going to be a perpetual uh, motion of kicking the can down the road, because now it's going to have to go back to the European Union, and we're supposed to hear from the European Union tomorrow as to whether or not they're going to grant an extension or not. So we're going to have to wait and see on that. So we're far from it, but that's the brief update in regards to Brexit. Perhaps a general election on December the 12th. Vice President Mike Pence, his Mike Pence, his speech today in regards to China, uh, rather combative, rather combative in nature. However, still opening uh, the door, offering an open hand to hopeful, tr successful trade negotiations. So pretty much calling China out for being the culprit behind the Hong Kong protests, supporting the protests in Hong Kong, which is right, uh, going after the NBA and Nike, basically saying, look, you're, you're, you're foregoing um, American principles. You're saying hell with the U.S. Constitution and hell with what we believe in as Americans. Uh, we just want that money. Uh, 1.4 billion Chinese, that's a huge market. Uh, yeah, we don't care about the Constitution. We just... We, we just want um, we just want the money. Yeah. We don't care about the men who are on the money that we're going to receive. You know, George Washington, Hamilton, Franklin, all those guys. We don't give a damn about them and what they did. We just want the money. We just want the money. So a disgrace. I will not be watching basketball. I, I, not that I watched it to begin with, but I might watch the playoffs or, or, the, or the championship games. No, I'm done with them. I'm done with them. I'm done with the NFL. I'm done with pretty much all of it. Uh, for a number of reasons. But this, I mean, it's all about money. That's all these people care about. That is the soul and heart of this country, and it's gone. The Constitution be damned. We just want the money. 
well, you know, it's not going to be too long now until this country dissolves, if that's going to be the mentality. Uh, but still, Vice President Pence was saying, you know, we can still, despite these things, we still hope that we can reach an agreement with some of these trade talks. Uh, you know, I grow more and more doubtful every day, of course. Uh, we have some sources out there that are saying, well, you know what? When it comes to this phase one, China is reportedly saying that we'll, we'll buy $20 billion worth of agricultural products in the first year. Wow, Tommy, that much? Uh, do you know what that is, folks? $20 billion in agricultural products? That's exactly what the Chinese used to buy before this whole you-know-what storm started uh, two years ago. It's going right back to where it was. But in the meantime, Donnie Boy broke it, and now he's going to pat himself on the back for attempting to fix it. All we've done is gone right back to where we started two years ago. Remember, trade wars are easy to win. So you have all of the uncertainty. You have the global economy that is deteriorating. This trade war nonsense exacerbates those problems. And where are we going to get out of it? Exactly what we had beforehand. And in the interim, what's China going to get in return? Are we going to cut tariffs? Are we going to remove tariffs? Or, or are we going to say, well, the tariffs that are supposed to come on into effect in December, those ones are off the table now, if China does make good? And that's for the first year. And this is only phase one. So China, you know, you're going to have to wait and see. Is China going to continue to buy that many goods for a year and have tariffs removed? And as long as they're buying soybeans and pork bellies, you know, Donald Trump's happy? What about intellectual property theft? What about forced technology transfers? What about all of the human right problems? Though That's the crux of this deal. Not soybeans. Hell, they were buying soybeans before. It's, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? The United States is an agricultural powerhouse, okay? East coast to west coast. We are an agricultural powerhouse. China has 1.4 billion mouths to feed kind of makes sense that they'd be buying that kind of volume year over year. I mean, we're going right back to where we started. So if you want to continue to be lied to, then I guess you like it. I mean, I, I don't know what else to tell you. So that's that, but we'll see what transpires. Now to the impeachment inquiry. Okay, deep breath. Take a pause. Do your best to turn off CNN. Do your best to turn off MSNBC. Do your best to turn off Fox News. Because these are some of the largest corporations in the world. They are driven to make a profit. And I don't demonize profit. But when it's, in, when it's dealing in misinformation and disinformation and not having the full picture, because nobody does, because a lot of the information that is surrounding this impeachment inquiry is behind closed doors. But nevertheless, that does not stop these pundits, these quote-unquote journalists, these commentators, these stations and outlets from speculating, from talking about it 24-7. And who do you believe? You believe who you want to believe. If you do not like Donald Trump, if you hate him, if you despise him, you're probably watching MSNBC. If you just, you know, you don't like him, you think he's not a good guy, you're probably watching CNN. If you love Donald Trump, or you can kind of support him, you're probably watching Fox. See how easy it is to throw everybody in a bucket? Who disagrees with that? Raise your hand. Not a one of you. Because you're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. We all want to hear the things we want to hear, and that's where we go. We go deeper and deeper into our silos. That's why this country is becoming more and more divided. And guess what? Fox, CNN, MSNBC, they're making money hand over fist. They don't care. They don't care. Maybe there's a few people on those broad on, on those networks that honestly care about the truth. But come on, they're looking to make the money. Just like the NBA and Nike and everybody else going to China want to make their money. Same thing here with the news media. Same thing here with them. Okay? It's a sad day. It's a sad state of affairs in this country. But that's what it's all about. And so you're hearing what you want to hear. He's corrupt as the day is long. We're going to nail him to the cross. MSNBC, CNN. This is a deep state conspiracy. They cannot stand Donald Trump because he is draining the swamp. Fox News. You see how easy this is? And I, you know, I, have, I know I have people on this audience that are on both sides. I have people that are far left. I got people on the far right. I got people in the middle. I have comments that come through. I've, you know, I've, I've got a little bit of everybody, and that's what I want here. 
I don't want to be a station or a podcast that is siloed in either. I want everybody here. I want to question everything. I want to be questioned. My analysis, my opinion, my commentary, I want to be questioned on everything too. I don't know everything. I don't pretend to know everything. But what I do know is that nobody knows the entire truth in this matter in the media. That the entirety of Congress, Democrat, Republican, Congressman, Congresswoman, Senator, they don't know either. So when you have these type of political stunts that have been taking place over the past couple of days, where you got about 20 or 30 Republicans going down into the basement of the Capitol where these closed-door depositions are taking place and storming in, this is ridiculous. What are you, six years old? This is an investigation. This is akin to a grand jury. The state makes their case to a secret grand jury. So that's why this is behind closed doors. That's why there's no audience. That's why there's no cameras. Does it make sense? That's the system. That's how this works. Because I'm going to get to the politics of this too in a second. But this is the process. You do not want the suspect, in this case Donald Trump, knowing what is being said in the grand jury. You don't. That's not how it works. You have an investigation. You don't want to. You, you're not going to allow the suspect to have the evidence. You're not going to allow the suspect to know the whole picture, because you want to see if you can catch the suspect in a lie, because that's going to show guilt. That's how it works every single day in this country across the country. That's how it works. Investigators, lawyers. That's what happens every single day because this is the president of the United States does not change a thing. This is an investigation. If the grand jury hears enough evidence from the state, from the prosecutor, and he puts up his, his evidence, he puts up his witnesses, and that grand jury convenes and they say, yeah, there's enough evidence to move to trial, then you move to trial. During that process, those hearings, during the trial itself, the defendant, in this case, potentially, potentially Donald Trump, gets to confront his accusers. He gets to call his own witnesses. He gets to talk to the witnesses that the state used to bring the case and the charges against him. He gets to bring up his expert witnesses. He gets to bring in other evidence that showcases I didn't do it, somebody else did it, or whatever the defense is going to be. That's how this works every single day. He is not crucified to the cross, sorry MSNBC, CNN listeners, and is he sus or subject to a deep state conspiracy? Sorry Fox News listeners, because that's the argument. I didn't do it. It's a, it's a deep state conspiracy coming against me. I didn't do anything because those things aren't mutually exclusive, ladies and gentlemen. Because for the sake of argument, perhaps, let's just entertain it, that there is a deep state conspiracy against Donald Trump. That doesn't mean that Donald Trump is then innocent of what he is being accused of. You get it? They're not mutually exclusive. There could be a deep state conspiracy against him, and he could still have committed a crime. Political or actual. He could have done a high, cr uh, high crime and misdemeanor, which is basically uh, an abuse of power, or he actually could have broken some sort of federal statute. These things are not mutually exclusive. And I can assure you, I can assure you, if something continues to come out from these other investigations, and there's some breaking news that came out across the wires this evening, stating that the investigation into the genesis of the Trump-Russia collusion story is now being moved and turned into a criminal investigation. So that's not good news for those people. But there weren't a lot of details that were being released this evening, so I don't have a lot to give you on that. So that, But that's going to continue, and I can guarantee you if something does come out from that, that that will be a huge uh, defense argument for Donald Trump if this thing does make itself to trial. Now, in order for it to get to trial, okay, the grand jury has to convene and vote. In this instance, that's going to be the members of the House. Okay? They get to vote on it. Now, right now, a lot of this investigation is taking place behind closed doors, as it should. The vote, a lot of the other information, has to be made public. If Adam Schiff and the other Democrats of these committees, these leaders of these committees who are investigating this, if they do not, if they do not have public hearings, 
then this whole thing is a sham. This whole thing is a disgrace. And politically speaking, the Democrats are probably going to suffer massively for this. This will go down as one of the largest political blunders in history. And I stated that from the outset of this entire impeachment inquiry investigation. I stated that whenever I, we did the podcast on that a month ago, two months ago, however long it's been already, when we went through those documents, we said this can either turn into something that is going to bring this president down or to something that could truly backfire on the Democrats because they're so hungry and thirsty for blood. Because we gave Nancy Pelosi credit. We said, look, she's been putting this, in, this impeachment inquiry off for quite a while. But now mm, she's, she's turning. She made the decision to go forward with it, formally announcing an impeachment inquiry. So one of two things is likely to have happened. Either she became privy to knowledge that said, okay, well, this is so bad that this is what we have to do. We have to go through this investigation at this point. Or she is so afraid of the deranged lunatics on the far wings of her party that she's like, they're, they're going to cause a revolution within our party. Uh, we can't have it. So this is her best way to sort of diffusing that potential problem for the Democrats. It's probably one of the two, maybe a combination thereof. But that's the politics of it. But Nancy Pelosi has been in power for a long time. And if you love or hate her, it makes no difference. The woman's been there. And if you've been there, and if you're the Speaker of the House, you're third in line to the presidency, third in line, you know how to operate. Again, you might despise the woman. You might not be able to look at her, hear her voice. You might say she's crazy, can't stand her policies, whatever. Or you might love her. She knows how to operate. You don't, you don't get to those positions of power like that without knowing how to sidestep a few things and knowing how to maneuver. So you got to give her credit on that. Okay? So if she decided to move forward with this inquiry, one would think that there's something there where at least she's going to get an impeachment vote on Donald Trump. If that does take place following public hearings of information that comes out from these closed door, uh, these closed door meetings and depositions, and they move it to a vote, and they vote to impeach, and then it goes to the Senate. The Senate is where the trial is had. And again, that is where Donald Trump will be able to state his case, to call in his witnesses, to put out whatever defense he wants to do. That's where that takes place. So everybody has to understand this process. I understand it's emotional. I understand it's divisive. There's a lot of people that don't like this guy. There's a lot of people that absolutely love him. Me, I'm getting sick of him, personally. You know, it doesn't, I mean, I'm not voting for one of these lunatics on the left who are likely going to be, get the nomination. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's just a struggle. It's a sad state of affairs. There is no draining of the swamp, trillion dollar deficits, $2 trillion to the military industrial complex, banks continuing to make record profits. That is the swamp. That is the swamp. And now he's calling for lower interest rates, negative interest rates, and quantitative easing. Thanks a lot. Let's make this bubble even bigger. So when it bursts, the collapse is going to be even bigger. Fantastic. Fantastic. It doesn't get much swampier than that. Now you have these accusations of abuse of power, quid pro quo, all that stuff. And now you have even from the Democrats saying, well, you know, this whole whistleblower stuff, you know, everything else that we have, we don't even need the whistleblower anymore. Hmm, that's a little bit interesting. I've stated here before, in defense, not just particularly of this whistleblower, but in whistleblowers in general, I said, if you're going to make the decision to become a whistleblower, that is a major life decision. That's like deciding to get married, have children, take a job overseas. It is a major life decision that's going to have, you know, consequences and implications further and further down the road, for quite, quite uh, possibly for the remainder of your life. That's why it's a major life decision. The government is very powerful. I don't know if you're aware of this. They have virtually unlimited resources. If you come out against them, blowing the whistle, citing fraud, abuse, corruption, whatever. They're going to come after you. And there is a long history that supports my claim. So if you're going to come out and you're going to say something's wrong with the government, and here, this isn't, this isn't somebody who has a problem with the Department of Agriculture and some committee there that's moving funds around or something like that. This is somebody who's going after the President of the United States. 
the most powerful man in the world. So now you're really shooting high. So you think they're just going to sit there and take it? I don't think so. So this is a major decision because the government's going to come after you. They are. Are they going to bankrupt you with all of the legal fees? <laughs> Quite possibly. How long have you been with the government? Now, if you're somebody who's young, maybe you're not married, maybe you don't have any kids, maybe you really don't have a mortgage, you don't have, you don't have a whole lot, you haven't been contributing to your, you know, you know uh, your pension or any 401k or anything like that for a long time, so you really don't have that much to lose. Maybe you really just think you're being, you know, a, a noble warrior, if you will, and that you, whatever you heard, whatever you were a witness to, or heard even secondhand, uh, gave you such a chill that you felt compelled to become a whistleblower. That's fine, but you made that decision, and now obviously to some degree, uh, there's there's going to be consequences. You know, I don't want this person, of course, unless they you know they're lying or whatever, to to, to be put through the ringer and to be uh, bankrupted or to be attacked by somebody uh, because their their name is outed, and you have some radical Trump supporters or something go after this person because that's a real possibility, because Donald Trump does not hold his tongue very well on these types of people. He doesn't. He might condone a, 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 a violent act against this person after the fact, but before, is he going to say, don't go after this person to his people? Like, don't do it. Because he hasn't yet. In fact, he's alluded to say, you know, this person's a spy. And you know what we used to do to spies back in the day, don't you? Saying that they used to get killed, that they were executed. So this is not good. There is no tampering down the rhetoric from this president. He continues to turn up the heat and the volume on it as well. So you have to understand this. You know, it goes back a little, a little back and forth. I'm still, I'm still debating this internally, how I feel with this whistleblower, because I understand, to a degree, the position that they're in. And this is why this individual uh, came out. They didn't have firsthand knowledge, right? We know this. They had secondhand knowledge. And we said, well, why wouldn't the people who had firsthand knowledge come out? Well, maybe they're 40, 50 years old. They got a few kids. They got a wife. They got a mortgage. They got a pension that they're relying on. And they said, well, you know what? I don't, I don't want to lose my pension. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my wife. I don't want my kids to hate me because now everybody's going to know that it's me. That, that's reasonable. And it's, it's also a shame because somebody who is trying to do the right thing to cast sunlight on a, a, a bad deed, whether it's corruption, abuse of power, whatever it might be, is more concerned with losing their financial life, their family life, and a whole host of other things. They're more concerned with that because that's how the government is going to treat them. That's how the government's going to go after them. It's a sad state of affairs, too, in this country when you can't shed light on wrongdoing. Otherwise, you're going to become the victim. That's not good. So, you know, I honestly think that the, and again, I'm still thinking about it, I honestly think that the whistleblower should probably have to step forward to some degree and, and discuss this. Uh, but, you know, with all of the other information that's, that's probably coming out and some of that we already know that has come out because we've read the documents here, uh, it's been corroborated. So what the whistleblower states in their formal complaint has been coming true. So clearly the sources that they have are accurate. We have a long way to go. Uh, I know the Democrats, I believe, want to wrap this thing up. Uh, at least the closed door portion of this inquiry, I believe, by middle or the end of November. And then hopefully, like I said, there, there better be public hearings where a lot of this information is disseminated, and you can have another questioning of these of these individuals in public. That way the public is aware of what is taking place, because right now it's he said, she said, on a lot of the closed-door depositions uh, that have so far taken place. You have the Republicans that are coming out and saying, oh, we destroyed them under oath, we, they got nothing. Uh, and of course, we don't know if that's true or not, because we don't have the transcripts. And then you have the Democrats who are coming out and saying, you know, I, I, I was shaking in my boots the entire time. It was the fastest eight or ten hours of my entire life. The, 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 the witness was captivating with what they were telling me. I mean, you don't know who to believe. That's the problem. That's why I don't go down these rabbit holes. I wait for the documents to come out, and then we take the time to read them. And then we, we, we do our best to decipher what's the truth and what's likely to take place 
from there on. So I thought this was important today to sort of just take a step back, do a, you know, take a deep breath and go over this impeachment inquiry because there's a lot going on. Everybody's pointing the finger. There is a process in place. It's like a grand jury, information, investigation. You vote on it. You hear that you, you weigh the facts of the case from what you know. Then you go to trial if you think it's worth it. Those will be the next steps. So stay tuned, everybody. There's lots more to come, believe me, when I tell you. Stay diversified, stay vigilant, and stay with the Capitol News. I am Alex Caritas. Godspeed.